Hi everyone and welcome to Mike Likes Robots. Today we're starting a new series and that's how to move the JetBot using ROS control interfaces. Now I have in a previous video shown how to move a JetBot around using ROS commands, but that was with a very basic controller. It didn't have any feedback mechanism and it was made simple because I knew that a human would be controlling it either with a gamepad or with a keyboard. But what happens when we want to get more complicated? What happens if we want to drive it autonomously, like using a navigation stack from ROS? Well, then we want to start getting into ROS control, which is a way of driving your robot in a more standard way so that it works with the rest of the ROS ecosystem. Unfortunately, ROS control requires those interfaces to be written in C++, and all of our interfaces so far are written in Python, which makes this a great opportunity to find out how the serial commands work for the Jetson to control the motors. So to do that, we're first going to look at I squared C, which is how the Jetson can tell the feather wing chip how to move the motors. And then we're going to look at how the feather wing chip actually controls the motors to move forwards and backwards at particular speeds or to break and turn off. So first things first, what do I mean by the feather wing? That's exactly what I'm showing you on this page. This is the Adafruit Stepper and DC Motor Featherwing, which is the chip that is on the JetBot that I own that controls the motors. What happens is that the Jetson, which is the main computer board, can issue I squared C commands to the Featherwing in order to tell it how to drive the motors, how fast and when to brake. So we're going to look at Featherwing and how to drive it with I squared C and at how it controls the motors with PWM, that's pulse width modulation. So we're going to start with I squared C. This is I squared C, which is a short way of saying IIC or inter-integrated circuit. It's a way of controlling devices between circuits, so very close range. I'll give the link to this website in the description. The diagram on this page shows how devices are connected together. There are two main wires. There's the SDA wire and the SCL wire, often also called SCLK for clock. These two wires are all that's needed to connect one main device or master device with multiple slave devices. The master device can control the communication by sending out a clock signal on S clock and by sending out a request on the data line. So in our case, we would have a Jetson Nano board here as the master and a feather wing board here as one of the slaves. The diagram on this page shows how I squared C devices are connected together. What's important to note is that there is a bus made up of two wires. So this is the main I squared C bus. As opposed to other systems that use two wires like UART, UART communication is formed of pairs of devices. Each has two wires which go into the other device. The transmit from one reaches the receive on the other, and the transmit from the other reaches the receive of the first. That way both devices can talk at the same time. But there are issues here with communication. For example, there's no clock here defining how fast to send data. It's purely up to the devices how fast they choose to send data across one of these lines. And if they don't agree on that timing or one of them is off, then they don't agree on the data being sent and the communication doesn't work. I squared C solves this by dedicating one of the lines to being a clock line, which goes from the master device to all the slave devices it's connected to, and it defines the speed of the communication. That does mean that there's only one line to transmit data on, which is a weakness compared to UART. And that means that the master device has to issue all the commands and then wait for a response from the slave device so that they don't try and send data at the same time on the same line. So if there's one master sending data and waiting for a response from a slave, how does the slave know when to respond? If there are multiple slave devices, won't they all try and respond at the same time? The answer is they would, if not for an I squared C feature called addressing. Addressing in I squared C is when the master device sends out which slave device it's trying to talk to before it then makes its request. Each slave device then needs to know what address it should listen for. It listens to the communication, and if its address comes up, it listens to what's being requested of it and then responds. 
If we had multiple feather wings, we would need to tell each feather wing device what its address is on the I squared C bus so that communication can work properly. And the way that we do this is if we look at this feather wing board, there's this set of pins here. If we connect the two pins on A0, we're setting a bit in the address. We're changing the default address from 0x60, that's 96 in hexadecimal, to another address separate from the first one. This is what allows us to have multiple devices on the same bus. So, so far we have one Jetson board and one or more Featherwing boards communicating using I squared C. Now let's look at how the Featherwing controls the motors using PWM. To understand PWM, we want to understand how the motor moves to begin with. This is the product information page for the motor that's on the JetBot. And we can see here that there's a red wire and a black wire. These are the positive and negative terminals of the motor. Now it says that it's a 3 to 6 volt DC motor. Let's assume it's 6 volts for this explanation. If we want the motor to turn forwards, we want to put 6 volts onto its red wire and 0 volts onto its black. That will cause the motor to turn forwards. If we want the motor to turn backwards, we can put 6 volts on the black wire and 0 volts on the red wire, which will cause it to turn the other way. We also have another couple of modes for this. We have zero voltage on either wire, which means disable the motor. And we have six volts on each wire, which means break the motor as fast as you can. Between these, we can drive the Jetson around, full forwards, full backwards, or stopped. But we don't have any in between. How can we set it to go three volts forward, or 25% speed forwards, or backwards? The answer comes as PWM. This site cadence gives us a diagram for how PWM works. Essentially, we can switch the signal from 5 volts to 0, and depending on how often it's 5 volts on the wire versus 0 volts, gives us an average voltage. Now this only works if we switch on so fast that the motor can't actually keep up with the way it's switching on and off. Then, if we do this, we have the frequency, which is how fast it switches on and off. In this diagram, that's 10 kilohertz, or 10,000 times per second. And the duty cycle, which is how long it's on compared to how long it's off. Because 40% of the time the signal is on, and 60% of the time the signal is off, we say that this has a duty cycle of 40%. In this diagram, because our duty cycle is 40%, the mean output is 40% of 5 volts, which is 2 volts. That means that if this motor had this PWM signal, it would be driving forwards at 40% of its full speed. Now, generating this signal manually sounds like a lot of effort, but thankfully that's what the Featherwing is for. It has a dedicated PWM chip, which produces this signal for us. All we have to do is use I squared C to tell it what duty cycle to set and when. That's the next section. How do we command the feather wing using I squared C to output a particular PWM signal? Here we are in JetBot ROS Control, which is a new repository I've created with my C++ driver. To learn what I squared C commands to send from the JetBot to the feather wing, I first tried to look for some documentation and I wasn't able to find anything that said what I squared C commands to send. A lot of the time when you're working on I squared C interfaces like this, that documentation will be available. In this instance, if it's available, I couldn't find it, so I turned to the next best thing, the source code from Adafruit. Here we can see Adafruit's Python source code for their MotorKit library. This is a library that they provide anyone using their Featherwing to make it much easier to get up and running with their motors. It has a number of dependencies, including the PCA, the motor, the bus device, and the register packages. Between all of these, I was able to read through the code and figure out what I squared C commands to send. So let's take a look at the code and see what's going on. Now, one thing to mention before we dive into the source code is that this repository I will continue to update with the next instances in the series. 
meaning that it will be updated over time and the code I show now may disappear. So what I've done is created a tag with the code that I've used in this video. What you can do is you can check the tags list and click Jetbot Motors Part 1. Then if you do that, all of the code will be identical to what I'm showing in this video. You can also clone it using that same tag. So when you do the clone command, add a dash B and then put the Jetbot Motors Part 1 tag so that you check out the same version of the source code. Here I am SSH'd into my Jetbot and I have the code checked out already with that tag that I just mentioned. I'm also open in the dev container, meaning that I've got access to ROS2, even though I'm running on Ubuntu 18. If you want to be able to set up your Jetbot in the same way, I'd recommend watching my other video on how to set up the Jetbot that I'll link in the description and at the top of the video. Now we're in, let's take a look at what's going on. Now a lot of these files are just to make ROS work. For example, the package.xml defines the node that we can build in ROS2. The CMake lists define how to build the ROS2 node. For example, it defines which source files to compile in order to make it work. We also have a README with build instructions. But what we're really here for is to see how we're sending commands to the Featherwing in order to make the motors move. So the first thing that we're doing is inside the constructor of the node is to make an I2C device. This is using the Linux drivers for opening and controlling an I2C bus. And we'll take a look at that in the moment. All we're doing here is having a high level look at what the flow is like in the program. Once the device is created, it's handed off to two instances of a motor class. And again, we'll look at that in a moment. Another important note here is that the two motor classes need to know which pins the PWM chip is putting the PWM signal on in order to drive them. That's what this 8910 and 131112 is. We'll see those more in the motor class. While the node is running, every 500 milliseconds, it will call this time a callback, which sets the motor spinning either true or false. So we're not setting a speed here, we're setting fully on or fully off, but we'll see in the code that there is a way to tone down how fast the motors move if we want. Now that we've seen the high level view of what the node is doing, that is, it's spinning the motors at full speed for 500 milliseconds and then off for 500 milliseconds, we can have a look at the I2C device and see how it's opening it up and sending communication. The I2C device class does a lot of the work in the constructor. It opens the I2C bus, which is a Linux way of doing it, and checks to see whether there was an issue with opening that file. If there was no issue, it means that this is open as a file that C++ can send I2C commands on. The next step is to try and select the device. Let's take a look at this method to see what it does. This is the try select device method. It's using a Linux method to use a slave device on the bus. So we're configuring it as if we're the master and there is a slave device on the bus. And it's also using the default device address. Now I mentioned with the Featherwing, in order to set the address, it has a default value of 0x60, or we can jump bits on the board in order to set a different device. Because I'm only using one and it has the default address, I've just hard coded that. Once the device is selected, we try and reset it to set it to a state that we know and no motors are spinning. All that we do for that is to set the mode to zero. Once that's done, we want to set up the clock. This is first time initialization stuff, which is why it's done inside the constructor. Once this is complete, we can send commands to the motors as often as we want. Now I won't show what the clock does because it's quite a few operations all in a row, but essentially what it's doing is writing to a register or reading from a register and then manipulating those values to set a PWM clock speed of 1.6 kilohertz. Once that's configured, we can use the I2C device class to set a duty cycle on the motor. So what happens is, if we're requested to set, let's say, the positive pin of a motor to a particular duty cycle, we can check whether it's a special case of fully on, a special case of fully off, or we convert it to a value that the PWN chip will understand. That's by shifting it four bits to fit in a 12-bit register, and then packing it into a particular way in the buffer 
that the chip will understand. Once the I2C device is initialized and the motors can use it to set a duty cycle, we are constructing the motors. This is the motor class, and it takes the I2C device, or rather a pointer to it because it's shared across multiple motors, it's taking the pins that it needs to communicate on, and it's taking a motor number, and that's purely so that we can generate error messages that reference the correct motor number. The enable pin is the first pin in the set of pins we receive, and we need to set that so that the motor comes online. The second and third pins are the positive and negative pins respectively, and they're the ones that we're setting a PWM signal on. So when we start up, we enable the motor using an enable pin, and then when we try set spinning, what we do is determine by whether we're spinning on or spinning off. The spinning on means that we want a high voltage on the positive terminal and a zero voltage on the negative terminal. So we set a maximum value of FFFF on the positive and zero on the negative. If we want to be not spinning, then we want to break, which is a special value where both pins have a voltage at the same time. By setting the maximum value, our duty cycle is 100%, which means that both wires are on continuously. That will break the motor for us. That means when we try set spinning true, the motor will spin forward as fast as it can, and when we try set spinning false, the motor will break as fast as it can. So now that we've seen the code, let's see it working in action on the JetBot. First, the way that we build this is with standard ROS2 build commands. First, we source our humble installation to get all the variables. There, now our ROS installation is initialized. The next thing that we're going to do is build the code, which we can do with Colcon build. Once that build is complete, we need to source our workspaces install setup.bash. If we forget to do this, it won't know what node we're talking about when we try to run Jetbot control. We can source install setup.bash, which gives us access to the command ros2 run Jetbot control, Jetbot control. Now the motors are running. So there we've seen how I2C works, how PWM works, and how to get the JetBot to send I2C requests to the Featherwing chip that controls the motors in order to make them spin or not spin, or spin at a particular speed in a particular direction. From here, we should work on extending our C++ interfaces to support ROS control, which gives us access to things like moving it around autonomously using ROS control, or using the ROS navigation stack, or moving in a particular defined path like a spline. I hope you enjoyed the video, and I'll see you in the next one.